I'm so done with Ikonomiya, guys. We have to talk about the chasm. So yeah, jumping over to the chasm. That was introduced a bit of a ways after Enconomia. It became sort of an add-on landmass to Liyue that had already been mentioned a lot uh, in other parts of the Liyue story. Uh, we finally got it. It's a big hole in the ground. Uh, big surprise. Big surprise. Uh, that was an old mine. And man, do they treat this place like a universal ride of just story event after story event as you go deeper and deeper in? It's like you hop in the mine cart and you just go through all these events it, it really felt like it before we get too much into the story though i will say i love the chasm overworld <laughs> yeah yes yeah. Um, agreed agreed on that one first of all the music mwah, amazing very, very good and second of all, they got to kind of take inazuma a uh, design principles and loop them back into liue which is cool because liue it's a little sparse it's a little bare bones but it is cool that they'll be able to go back and kind of touch it up as they do more stuff the chasm finally gave us very geo intrinsic terrain features and puzzles the way that like the thunder spheres and the thunder sakura are integrated into inazuma it was really cool to see things like the geo resonators worked back into liyue so one of the things that was really great um about inazuma as sort of previously established was that each island was kind of a sandbox that touched upon one of the themes of the country, be it elemental or um, thematic. And the chasm kind of represents one of the first instances of them going back to the earlier areas of the game and saying, let's capture something about the geo element that we previously didn't have in the game. Uh, in this instance, the big honking mine that they previously only alluded to. And also just the, what was it, the the old, like, fantasy horror trope of, like, you have this mind that brings up all this, like, really good resources, and then you dig a little too deep and wake something up that really shouldn't have been woken up. Yep, the the four words you don't want to hear about a mind in a fantasy setting, they dug too deep. Boy, did they. I really loved from a visual perspective it was a bit of a corny mishmash of different scenes but it was cool that they broke it up you know Enkanomia, it's all kind of washed out kind of same same like greek hills meets the dead ocean floor but in the chasm proper there's like the overworld area there's the big shaft with these huge structures and all this verticality then you go a little deeper and you see weird fossils and lush rainforesty things and you meet our friend zanzibar the talking mushroom in an area where the map is just shit and useless at least having them kind of broken up by appearance helps you kind of figure out where you are yeah they also did a good job of breaking things up just even in the story by having like the different checkpoints that the excavation team go to so you have like kind of different bases of operation that you can teleport to and stay at which help mark your progress as you're going further and further in um, and the mine classics of like pockets of explosive gas Mm -hmm. like substance leakage they probably shouldn't be standing in and leeway's old staple the mining cannon <laughs> yeah oh, the yeah. mining cannon you gotta have a mining cannon and then of course there was the iterating on the bokuso box they sort of dealing with all the sludge and mud which was all right it wasn't my favorite um, it's kind of amazing how they iterated twice over the bokuso box and the crystal uh, to ultimately have something that still feels very half-assed. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe there was a band-aid involved with both the Bokuso and the Crystal, where it's like, I kind of think what they wanted to do was put you on a timer, where like it would deplete as you got further from a light source, and maybe also when you took damage, and then like something adverse would happen to you when you didn't have that juice anymore. And I just think they didn't know how to level design around it. So they just kind of nerfed the idea and made it like a magic thing to interact with some obstacles instead. I mean, it was probably mobile again. By the way, they need an official in-game term for the dark mud. Like, yeah, it's bad. You call it like the miasma or something, please. The story is a concurrent Archon quest and world quest. Archon quests are main quests. They get voiced. World quests don't but they are arguably as important as each other also world quests don't get archived in your story archive where you can reread the text at least hey hoyover 
can we, can we fix that please like like you can't have the story of this mining team happening at the same time as and being as important as the stuff with Dan's leaf. It's so weird. I would love for them to, you know, implement like a saving quest dialogue transcripts better because like having some just disappear <laughs> once you're done with them is not great, guys. Especially because hot take. I just thought the miners story was a lot more interesting. And I'm not just saying that because there's a guy named Christopher. Yeah. Like, yeah, for, for context, we're talking about Clitofo. Jesus Christ, the, the, the first time I saw his name, I was like, wow. <laughs> I mean, I'm guessing it's like a treasure hoarder thing. He's like, yeah, they call me Christopher <laughs> because they can never find me. God. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Fucking Chris! Anyway, the main takeaway from the story of the mining party is you get a viewpoint of people who don't have visions. It is the boots on the ground look at what everyday mortal thinks of the gods, what their relationship to them is, and how that might be different from vision users. They they deem themselves to be more relatable to the common man than vision holders but also have an intense anxiety about, am I not favored? Am I not worthy? Does that mean my life has less value? I like to see that struggle between like the mundane people who are left behind in this. There was that really interesting line from the Millilith guy uh, uh, in the overworld part of the chasm for that world quest where you have to find like the artifacts from the battle from 500 years ago, where he says, how do you think these soldiers felt who didn't have visions, who were asked to die for their god, who clearly didn't care enough about them to notice them. And it's like, holy shit, that got dark. Yeah. Yeah, and, yeah. and a bunch of people have different takes on it as you learn through that story quest. They're like, you know, one's like, yeah, I'm I'm glad I don't have a vision. I don't want to alienate myself from the common people who I love and I identify with. And then you have Chong, whose whole thing is like, I'm going to basically work myself to death to prove to myself that I'm worthy just because I have so much anxiety over these vision holders and these people who've done so much more than me. You don't have a vision as the traveler, but like the way she talks about vision holders is she's very much self-deprecating where she's like, what I'm doing, it doesn't matter as much as this vision holders yeah. do. Like it's, it's very unsettling to just hear that all the way through. It's extremely dark. And there was also that bit in Nozomo where A was like, yeah, I'm not actually in charge of handing out visions or anything. So that's some fun stuff. And so that's why the world quest is a lot more interesting than like Dan's Leaf showing up and, and telling us some things that like we kind of guessed. Like, oh, he's immortal, but he's a weird immortal because of the curse. And also uh, hilly churls are just kind of like, the common folk of the pre-Archon civilizations, including Conria, not necessarily Abyss Order affiliated because that's kind of like an almost political movement who just got churled as a result of being caught in the crossfire. They're old as hell and they all want to die. But like, we're millennials, so tell us something we don't know. So... That brings us to the last little chunk of pre-2.8 content, which was the Archon Quest Perilous Trail. And I hated it. <laughs> it was a bottle episode. Um, I think the biggest takeaway from it, the bottom line, is as you get closer to the Abyss, uh, you get closer to chaos and time gets more funky. But the game is probably inside of a giant Dyson sphere, so you're probably actually getting close to the closer to the upper atmosphere, and that's a really mainly it. We got to see Bosatius, uh, Bosatius, who's been like teased at uh, since Shao's early trailers. Yeah, and um, and who was hinted at as the purple Yaksha guy in the um, artifact set that came with the chasm, which uh, kind of a high turnover from. Both the world quest that features him where you find his grave and the artifacts. And, you know, I like my Easter egg hunts, but I like a little more time to kind of ruminate on them between that and the payoff. But anyway, my gripe with Perilous Trail is that three times in a row, they've told a story in Liyue where the only thing they stick is the landing. They can't keep getting away with it. It's so poorly paced until you get to the point with the 
kind of the escape room uh, time traveling area. I was so excited to see the Inazuman characters interacting with more Liyue characters, especially because Yanfei is in the story as an important story character for the first time, aside from just being like your teapot chaperone. But everyone was just kind of awful to each other in ways that just didn't give us anything with these characters. Uh, Xiao is just kind of like doing more of the same as he always does. Ito was insufferable. Yelon was just lame as hell. And like, it was such a poor showing for <laughs> everybody. And then it hits its stride. And then it ends with the big emotional, like very powerful, impactful finale. But it's the same pacing as Shenha's and the main Liyue Archon quest where it's like at the end it's just so solid and it's so good but everything up to that was like weird and a waste of time so that was super bizarre because it didn't feel like it was it didn't really feel like it was supposed to be anything yeah the entire like three or four hours I was playing through the main story on and it was not great it's kind of like the bizarro version of Iridori because here's an ensemble of characters, but they just don't have any interesting chemistry. They don't play them off each other. They don't even like bicker in a way that's fun to see opposing viewpoints. It's just a bunch of like stubborn assholes. I think Yanfei and Shinobu like walked away from this as being pretty cool. They both kind of did the same thing as far as like being the, yeah. the glue and the brainy ones. They they were a little redundant, but I think that was primarily because they both had a similar background for the purposes of this, where they're both like, oh, the law school graduates from, and Kuki's role was like to kind of be Ito's handler, while Yenfei's role was to eventually find Xiao. And boy, did Ito need a handler, because like a lot of the crap, like he did have, of course, like toward the end, had the cool moment where he went Super Saiyan and punched that wall open, but like it's worth mentioning that a lot of the trouble started because he was being a dumbass and like not in a funny way, just in a dumbass way. Yeah. I feel like none of the characters were enjoyable at all in this whole thing. Shinobu and Yenfei were like zero sum characters and then everyone else was just actively irritating. And oh. they just like kept rehashing the point, trying to get Xiao to value his life more, ask for help more and be less self-sacrificial but they retread it like three times. It, it, it's almost like it felt like the Archon quest needed to be of a certain length. And so they just padded the, the trapped in a chasm part. With yeah. And I think that to the game's credit, I think that Chow having this be essentially his third quest where you're trying to like get him to break out of his wartime mindset. I feel like this is the one that actually felt the best best and i'm also hoping that this is sort of the last time we kind of have to contend with it just because it seemed to be the time that um had the stakes at a level that were actually appropriate for the level of emotional conflict that xiao seems to be going through i gotta hope so yeah and then you have the emotionally cathartic moment of seeing his family and the other yaksha the echo of him like being like, oh, this is my family now. And it's like, boy, I wish everything leading up to this had been better delivered. I definitely get the sense that these people are not going to walk away from this experience as found family. I don't think any of them are going to talk to each other again after that. Shao should have joined the gang. That's the direction it should have gone in. The Takuya. Yeah. Oh man, can you imagine? He could have gotten one of those little commissar caps. Uh, he doesn't yeah. even need it. He has a cool demon mask. <laughs> also, I regret to inform past me, the moose fighting ship has sunk before it ever launched. <laughs> I would not inflict Ito on Yanfei ever. He was pretty awful. But we hey, we did get canonical acknowledgement of Ushi. Ushi That's was true, yeah. the best character. <laughs> In the story, he was a wonderful little gentleman. Always had insightful things to say. Their desire to not provide any new animations for him means that he was just a constant source of vibes. 
while everyone is there hashing out their little anime problems, he's just out there boogieing in the corner, really giving us something to smile about in this soul draining storyline. All right. Anyway, we're going to take a couple audience questions. We thought that before we move on to Sumeru, we wanted to see if there was anything you guys wanted us to cover, and you had a couple fun questions, so we thought we'd just go down the row and answer them. First one is, who are your favorite characters in terms of playability or outfit? I, for one, would love Tin Gun to rate these wacky anime people. Wholeheartedly agree. Everyone in Genshin dresses like a complete lunatic, but Ningguang is impeccable. She literally looks like a million bucks. I don't have to, like compromise my sense of aesthetics to be like, yo, she just looks amazing. And that's why I look like this. In terms of playability, I like people who have fun, weird, normal attacks, so that's why I main Yenfei. And I've also been really enjoying the hell out of uh, Heizo. He's not really leveled, but he's a lot of fun. And also just, I like a parry, so I will pace my fights out in a way where I can just switch to Beto and do those perfect parries and keep the flow of the fight going. It's fun. So I guess uh, on my side, uh, yeah, I think that uh, the Ningguang drip is real. Um, Ningguang looks awesome. It, it was really nice going into the game, starting the game off before I knew who any of the characters were, finding out that there was a Geo Mage, which in Genshin isn't just your Earth magic, but is like really amber and crystal oriented. It's like, oh, there's an Earth Mage lady. Oh, she's the richest lady in the whole wide world. <laughs> oh, she has all these like cool gameplay mechanics. Like the Ningguang Zhang Li combo on paper is something that I really like because it was cool that there was like geo resonance where it's like, oh, all geo constructs are going to unleash these shockwaves. Uh, in practice, their damage isn't super great. But I liked all of the Geo characters enough to have collected all of them and try to like combine them and mash them into different configurations. Of course, the best character to play is Ayaka with Kazuha supporting her. That just makes you feel like you're able to shred just about everything. Ayaka feels like the best parts of Virgil from Devil May Cry, uh, hyper simplified, but you know, all in one package. Special mention goes to Yelon and Shinobu's designs were good enough for me to like blow all of my primo gems on them. <laughs> so enough said on that, really. So um, it should come as no surprise from both a gameplay and a divine perspective. My favorite character is Child by a pretty wide margin. There is a caveat, though. So while I really love Child's design, the one I like even more is sort of the uh, darker outfit. I'm still really hoping for um, an alternate outfit. Um, from a gameplay perspective, though, I really like him because I don't normally go in for ranger characters, but the idea of sort of marking foes and then capitalizing on that, especially with the sort of living bomb status effect, I think is one of the coolest and most fun things you can do for a character. It took me longer than I would have liked to get a child, but I did technically sign up for the game with the intention of getting him. In terms of other characters that I enjoy playing, Kazuha is a lot of fun just because that vacuum synthesizes really well with Child. In terms of primary DPSs, I think that Ito has been a really good path at sort of innovating Claymores and making them a little bit less clunky to play. So, because I'm one of those people who pops in and out of this game, um, I think visually, I actually really like Hakomi's design. I mean, like, I know people weren't really impressed with, like, either her character beats or what have you, but she is pretty cute, so. And also the, like, firing little fish as pretty tells. And, and that high <laughs> ponytail, that's why she's Mariana Grande. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> I, I do like some equal opportunity skimp on the dudes, too. So, like, you know, Goro gets a little bit of a mention because he's got his midriff. <laughs> oh, my God. We went this whole episode without talking about Messina. <laughs> okay. I mean, I've been playing around with Hazel lately, which has been really fun. I got to play around with some party combos I don't usually use. Otherwise, I fall into the trap of putting up a shield and grouping with Kazuha and then, you know, obliterating things and or people with that kaching that I keep memeing about, but I actually have gotten a lot of use out of. Yeah, I guess that's that's all for me. Uh, so I guess I'm just gonna 
continue the trend of picking multiple characters for things. Uh, in terms of gameplay, I love all of the Archer characters. I, I think there's very few of the ones that I've come across that I have been dissatisfied with. Like Ganyu, who just has been my workhorse for the entirety of my time in Genshin. I find her design of like higher charge shots that take a little longer to build up, but will deal increased damage to be really interesting as well as her maneuverability with her skill. And then Yoi Mia, uh, who I absolutely love. I like her as a character, but also her gameplay is fun. Her as a normal attacking character was really interesting because we didn't really have an archer character prior to that. And so seeing her as like this freaking Gatling gun that just takes down enemies super quick on her combos was a lot of fun. And I've been kind of working on a team to increase her attack speed as much as possible to see how how that goes. So. And then in terms of design, uh, I really like the characters that have like patterns in their outfits, but like... Uh, Kazuha and Yoimiya are two examples that I really love. They have very warm palettes with like the cool little motifs on their kimonos. Uh, I really like Yoimiya's asymmetrical design where she has an armor piece on one of her legs and then a sleeve on one arm while the other one's kind of off. She has tattoos on her arms, which I don't think we have too many tattooed characters in this game. So th those are just kind of the characters that I I'm really drawn to and whose designs I really like. All right, next question is, what are your favorite past events and or mini games? I'm a relatively new player, so I'm wondering what I missed. <laughs> I'm just going to rule out any heavily narrative focused event because I think that's kind of cheating. Well, um, there goes half of them. <laughs> OK, look, <laughs> favorite event all time is Labyrinth. Absolutely. Bring it back. We can't say enough about Labyrinth. We want it all the time. We want it to be the end game. Um, runner up i really liked the last rhythm game event the drum along that was super fun it, it was their most hashed out rhythm game it had a gorgeous ui and it had fun if jank beat maps i'm all about it windbloom had a lot of really fun stuff i think we talked a little bit earlier on the podcast about the potential for the uh, mario party stuff and i remember remarking at the time that like if they kept the consistency of weird little mini games in the game as quest lines npcs were giving you the amount of side content would be comparable to a yakuza game it was really good i, I didn't think that all of them were hits but i did like the audacity of trying of course, Labyrinth was the best combat event they've done. Everyone likes Hades. And I think that it was really rewarding for, you know, free to play, cheap to play, having that one power that let you increase your entire party's constellation level. That was not only super fun, but speaking a little bit more cynically, that was also a good, like, motivator to show you, hey, maybe you should spend a little more money to get these constellations. And yeah, Oh, I guess there is one other, like, guilty pleasure event that I had, and that was the Iki, because it allowed me to use more of my party than I originally would have in a setting that wasn't Spiral Abyss. I think at, at maximum there, you could have about 12 characters on six teams of two. I liked the opportunity to kind of see, like, you know, the work I'd put into the game pay off for something. Um, I think that my favorite event so far was Iridori Festival. I do like any event with parrying. The parrying stuff was a lot of fun. I'm also a really big fan of Theater Mechanicus, but I do think there was probably a sweet spot of an earlier iteration before Iridori that might have been a little bit better for. I think there was like a, this, a fishing event a while back, which was... I don't know, I got a shiny new fishing rod out of it. That was pretty cool. I also liked the Labyrinth Warriors. I mean, uh, the roguelike thing was fun. Honestly, I don't really bother with Spiral Abyss. I would probably play Spiral Abyss more if it was like that. That's basically it. <laughs> uh, in terms of the non-narrative events, I mean, uh, yeah, Shiki Taisho's Murder Mansion, still at the top there. I did like the rhythm game ones. But I think definitely my all-time favorite is the Golden Apple Archipelago stuff. Next question is, what are your favorite weapons? Not the ones in terms of best in slot, but ones you think that are cool in terms of effect or design or make you think about how to play clever. <laughs> I will admit the mechanics of the weapon are probably the last thing I ever look at. 
I have to learn the character. I have to learn like what stats are good for them. And so by that point, I'm just willing to like ask the meta people and just take their word for whatever works. You know, Genshin, you just don't have time to be experimental. You have to be efficient. And so I have to admit, I really don't play that much with weapons, most of which the unique effects just end up being some kind of multiplier anyway. So it doesn't really affect my gameplay. That being said, I love engulfing lightning, aka the grass cutter. I think it's really pretty. It's it's an elegant naginata. I also like Hakushin Ring, not for the design and certainly not for the game viability. I want it to be good for someone though, because the weapon story for it is absolutely gorgeous. It's Kitsune Saigu's last living moments as she recalls her life, and it's it's very pretty and poignant and ties into Inazuma. Uh, I'm kind of in the same boat in that uh, I'm mostly just getting weapons to fill character niches. If we're talking what I like visually, I was fortunate enough to have picked up Miss Splitter Reforged and Wolf's Gravestone, both of which are fantastic weapons that have some really nice design aspects to both of them. Uh, they both elevate whatever characters they're equipped to. I think that all of the weapons in the Weapons of Leeway series do look really great. Summit Shaper, Unforged, Vortex Vanquisher, and Memories of Dust. I love all the angular designs on them. I love their, like, yellow-gold glow. Um, they're never anything I would deliberately ask for or try to roll because I have limited time and money. But um, they all do look very good, and I think that the design on them is nice. I'm in a similar boat um, in terms of just the sheer pragmatism of best and slot for weapon choice. In terms of weapons I'm particularly fond of, though, I do like the Thundering Pulse on Child. Um, I'd like it a little bit more if he had, again, the darker outfit, but alas. Um, and another one I'm a fond of is I like the design of the Cinnabar Spindle. Um, I like it a little bit more when the weapons contrast with their wielder, and that weapon very much kind of echoes Albedo's design a little bit too closely for my taste, if not for the fact that I think that I otherwise like the weapon's design quite a bit, and I think it's probably my favorite among the um, regular sword-type weapons. Um, I don't have it, but I also really like the design for the Aqua Simulacra. That's definitely one of the standout designs for me at the very least. Honestly, I'm shallow. I like I like the weapons that like appeal to my aesthetic senses. So like even if I don't really end up using them that often because whatever character I have them equipped on is not deployed like ever. <laughs> um I do really like the solar pearl. It's it looks really stylish. I, I do kind of really like how the weapons when you as, as you ascend them like sort of change subtly. It's not really all that noticeable i think on the high rarity weapons but you see like the solar pearl like brightening up as you ascend it so like that was neat i guess also uh special mention for kagura's rarity because <laughs> this is like the kagura dance bells like i'm not like a practicing observer or anything of like shintoism but i don't know the aesthetic of the bells is kind of neat so <laughs> For me, in terms of aesthetics, I really like uh, the Thundering Pulse Bow and the Song of Broken Pines Claymore. Uh, the Thundering Pulse just is really cool with like the you know bright purple contrasted with the gold and like the lightning kind of curving off of that little uh, circle off the top of the bow. It it's just a really neat design element there that really shows that like this is from the Thunder Weapon set. Uh, and then the Song of Broken Pines is kind of a weirdly elegant claymore in that it has like that bright blue in the in the kind of core of the blade as it goes up. And as you level it up, it gets brighter. But the one thing that I also really love about the gameplay of the Song of Broken Pines is the fact that it gives a attack speed increase after a certain number of hits. But also this line from the description, which is the um, unsung half of a folk song of Mondstadt, which is leave the keen steel to those who will give their lives for the fight prepare the thieves gallows sharpen your rusted arrows for when the music sounds we shoot the beasts down and that is referring to the aristocrats that is so fucking cool <laughs> that's pretty yeah. good that's uh that's eula's claymore by the way yeah so she's like i'll pretend i don't see that 
I'll pretend I don't see that. I won't let my family know about this. I love I that I do not Eula is a dancer and her claymore is themed after like a, a, a folk dance lyric. That's about murdering nobles of which she's about, a part about of about class. Rich, but you know. <laughs> yeah. But in terms of gameplay, I like the weapons that uh, increase things that aren't just straight up attack. And so that's why I really like the song of Broken Pines because it, it increases attack speed, which can apply a little bit more to other characters. Yeah, I think that's the only one that we've really talked about that actually markedly changes how you play the, the game. Like, it's going to feel different. It's not just a different number. Yeah, exactly. And last question is just hopes for the future. We're going to do one reasonably attainable hope and then one unreasonable hope. <laughs> My reasonable hope is a diplomacy storyline event where you see all the world leaders. I would absolutely kill to see Jean, Ningguang, some Inazuman delegate, and then whoever and whoever, like, at some kind of summit doing some goofy Star Trek political shenanigans. I just think that'd be so fun to see them operating on this high level of government. And maybe there's, like, a fancy party that we can crash or something. My unreasonable hope is... Mihoyo, we know you just kind of throw spaghetti at the wall in terms of putting weird genres in Genshin. And I'm telling you, Tony Hawk is right there. I would love to see some skateboarding. Unironically, fucking ironically I would love to do it. I want the trick meter. I want to do 360 Christ airs. Please, what? let us skateboard. And not just the Traveler. I don't want it to be like fishing where it's just the Traveler doing it. I want to see all of my characters on skateboards. So for reasonable hope, number one, Aether and Lumine get to be good. They're like, kind of like terrible playability. Views. Yeah, yeah. Um, like make them have some skills that are worthwhile. I know that it's intentional to make you want to roll other characters, but I would like to see an accumulation of their power going up as you play through the game. On that note, um, dual elements, enough said. The unreasonable stuff. Uh, three stars. If there are lower star characters, having them have things that are actually interesting to do. Um, I'm not really going to go into all of that, but um, something to that effect. Uh, and then the really controversial one is actually more crossovers. Because I think that the way that Aloy was handled was good, given the circumstances. We're pretty sure that she was the bargaining chip for PlayStation users to be able to cross-save their accounts with PC. Genshin is a really, really tonally consistent game. And it would have to be handled with a level of finesse that would probably bar a lot of the stuff I would like to see from getting in. <laughs> We'll see how well it is. Aloy is basically almost a non-factor, but... Um... Maybe they could do something like both with the crossover and the three-star concept where it's like it's a very limited, almost kind of half a character, like an assist trophy almost. Who would your desired, tonally consistent crossover character be? If it was totally, tonally consistent, I would like to see monsters from Monster Hunter show up that we could fight. Oh, hell yeah. That is... Character-wise, uh, anything that Genshin was, like, you know, being derivative of, like, 2B or Link showing up would be super fun. Yeah, uh, I think, like, I think, like, 2B and Virgil would be yeah, the good Capcom, people. Capcom is willing to play ball. Um, no way in hell Link would show up. Virgil would be fucking amazing. Uh, Dante would not be tonally consistent with Genshin, <laughs> so I, de I don't know. He's also too much of a bum fuck to, like... <laughs> besides the Genshin cast in terms of being like weird little like perfect people yeah so. yeah would Dante be friends with Ito is yes. Ito too much yes. of a loser for Dante B. the thing is that Dante and Ito are both losers so they would be friends with each other the devil may cry Genshin crossover is Shinobu in the hospital like looking at Ito and Dante's broken necks and then be like what happened to you guys <laughs> Ito just leans over he's like hey Dante can I ask you a personal question? What's sex? People talk about it, but I don't get it. I don't and Dante's like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> God. <laughs> so uh, my reasonable expectation is more outfits. I think everyone likes the outfits. I'm surprised that so far they've been restraining them. I mean, I know that I shouldn't be asking for the kind of, I want to say, almost predatory approach that outfits in video games tend to follow. And so far, this game certainly hasn't been different. 
but I think everyone can agree that, especially among the most recent pair for them, they're pretty good. And I expect we'll see more of them, so... I just would like summer skins for, like, guys, because the male characters don't really get fed. Let the boys wear swimsuits, damn it! Exactly! Just let them have fun. I would say that my unreasonable hope for the future, uh, and this is probably going to be a little bit spicy, but I would say... <laughs> a character with some melanin that I would actually want to play from a gameplay perspective. Because <laughs> uh, getting a character with some melanin is already kind of a steep ask, and the chances of them actually having a gameplay style that I'd want to, you know, prescribe to is, I want to say like 30, 70. But yeah, that would be nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, let's see. As far as reasonable uh, hopes, I guess. Honestly, I just, <laughs> I just want a better archive when it comes to like quest stuff because sometimes, like, I don't know. I have Genshin open and I'm like eating dinner or something. I don't want to be running around because I can't really multitask. <laughs> I don't have enough brain cells for that. <laughs> so it's like nice to just, I don't know, like flip through the archive and like read through old like quest transcripts sometimes. But like. When stuff's missing or you, you know, you can't revisit any of the, uh, the old cinematic stuff, it's sort of just like, hey guys, hey whoever's, please throw me a bone here. Especially for things that they've already dumped a ton of money into, like the opera scene. Yeah, yeah, like, you, guys, you paid for that opera singer, come on! But, let's see, uh, I guess as far as, like, unreasonable hopes, um, yeah, honestly, I'm thinking, like, more playable character body types. Because on one hand, I get why they do the characters as they do. Because, like, it's like turnover turn over and also just, you know, if you have a skeleton already, there's a little bit less effort involved in modeling somebody new. But on the other hand, like, guys, can we... <laughs> I don't know. Guys, can we, like, I don't know. Please. A couple more body types would be great. Like, Please give us a couple more. Yeah, come on, Mihoyo. Up your character diversity just a little bit. Just let us be bit. jacked. <laughs> Oh my god, the Ito thing. Everyone was so pissed, rightfully so. That's the weird one, too. Like, you'd expect that to be an easy fell. And they have that body type in the game with the blacksmiths. Like, they just have to put a character skin over that. I think with the animations the blacksmiths do, it's okay. But, like, when your arms are that thick, they might just clip through themselves when you're doing certain things. I think that was, like, their, their issue. But they also have the money, so, like, fix it. Yeah, come on. Um, yeah, so I guess for my reasonable expectation slash hope, I do still really, really just want to pet the dogs. I have so many dogs in my teapot, and I can't do anything with them. They just run up and, like, get so excited when you're there, and it's like, I, I can't do anything about this. I have four dogs. Why can't I pet them all? I'm not a game developer. And I'm sure that takes a lot of work. But the dogs have been here for a very long time, and we still can't pet them. And kind of piggybacking off of that into my unreasonable expectation, I'd love to see like vehicles or mounts eventually implemented into the game. I, I know we teleport around, but it would be nice to be able to get to like certain points a little bit quicker and to just kind of help cover the vastness of Teyvat, especially since we have so many animal models already in the game. So that's going to do it as far as our pre-current patch, pre-2.8 content coverage. That means it's going to be two more weeks at least before you fuckers hear about the current patch. And in our, uh, you know, customary sign-off phrase now, uh, get the fuck out. No. Uh, no, in our customary sign-off, we uh, say, just like our good friend Kazuha, keep it sleazy, keep it breezy. <laughs> and Japanesey. <laughs> That's a... <laughs> That's a new Tata reference. Well done. I Good. mean, yes, but also. All right. Um, we should probably stop the recording. We're well over two hours. Yeah.